See Curse By Robert E. Howard First published in Weird Tales, May 1928 And some return by the failing light, and some in the waking dream. For she hears the heels of the dripping ghosts that ride the rough roof beam. Kipling They were the brawlers and braggarts, the loud boasters and hard drinkers, of Faring Town, John Korek and his crony Lie Lipkinel. Many a time have I, a tousled-haired lad, stolen to the tavern door to listen to their curses, their profane arguments, and wild sea songs, half fearful and half in admiration of these wild rovers. I, all the people of Faring Town gazed on them with fear and admiration, for they were not like the rest of the Faring men. They were not content to ply their trade along the coasts and among the shark teeth shoals. No yawls, no skiffs for them. They fared far, farther than any other man in the village, for they shipped on the great sailing ships that went out on the white tides to brave the restless gray ocean and make ports in strange lands. Ah, uh, I mind it was swift times in the little seacoast village of Faring when John Colrec came home, with his furtive lie lip at his side, swaggering down the gangplank, in his tarry sea clothes, and the broad leather belt that held his ever-ready dagger, shouting condescending greeting to some favored acquaintance, kissing some maiden who ventured too near, then up the street, roaring some scarcely decent song of the sea. How the cringers and the idlers, the hangers-on, would swarm about the two desperate heroes, flattering and smirking, guffawing hilariously at each nasty jest. For to the tavern loafers and to some of the weaker among the straightforward villagers, these men with their wild talk and their brutal deeds, their tales of the seven seas and the far countries, these men, I say, were valiant knights, nature's noblemen who dared to be men of blood and brawn. And all feared them, so that when a man was beaten or a woman insulted, the villagers muttered, and did nothing. And so when Maul Farrell's niece was put to shame by John Colrec, None dared even to put in words what all thought. Maul had never married, and she and the girl lived alone in a little hut down close to the beach, so close that in high tide the waves came almost to the door. The people of the village accounted old Maul something of a witch, and she was a grim, gaunt old dame who had little to say to anyone. But she minded her own business, and eked out a slim living by gathering clams, and picking up bits of driftwood. The girl was a pretty, foolish little thing, vain and easily befooled, else she had never yielded to the shark-like blandishments of John Colrec. I mind the day was a cold winter day with a sharp breeze out of the east when the old dame came into the village street shrieking that the girl had vanished. All scattered over the beach and back among the bleak inland hills to search for her, all save John Colrec and his cronies who sat in the tavern dicing and toping. All the while beyond the shoals, we heard the never-ceasing droning of the heaving, restless gray monster, and in the dim light of the ghostly dawn Maul Farrell's girl came home. The tides bore her gently across the wet sands and laid her almost at her own door. Virgin white she was, and her arms were folded across her still bosom, calm was her face, and the gray tide sighed about her slender limbs. Maul Farrell's eyes were stones, yet she stood above her dead girl and spoke no word till John Colrec and his crony came reeling down from the tavern, their drinking jack still in their hands. Drunk was John Colrec, and the people gave back for him, murder in their souls, so he came and laughed at Maul Farrell across the body of her girl. Sounds. Swore John Colrec, the wench has drowned herself, Lilip. Lilip laughed with the twist of his thin mouth. He always hated Maul Farrell, for it was she that had given him the name of Lilip. Then John Korek lifted his drinking jack, swaying on his uncertain legs. A health to the wench's ghost. He bellowed, while all stood aghast. Then Maul Farrell spoke, and the words broke from her in a scream which sent ripples of cold up and down the spines of the throng. The curse of the foul fiend upon you, John Colrec. She screamed. The curse of God rests upon your vile soul throughout eternity. May you gaze on sights that shall sear the eyes of you and scorch the soul of you. May you die a bloody death and writhe in hell's flames for a million and a million and yet a million years. 
I curse you by sea and by land, by earth and by air, by the demons of the oceans and the demons of the swamplands, the fiends of the forest, and the goblins of the hills. And you, her lean finger stabbed at Lilip Canole and he started backward, his face paling, you shall be the death of John Colrec, and he shall be the death of you. You shall bring John Colrec to the doors of hell and John Colrec shall bring you to the gallows tree. I set the seal of death upon your brow, John Colrec. You shall live in terror and die in horror far out upon the cold gray sea. But the sea that took the soul of innocence to her bosom shall not take you, but shall fling forth your vile carcass to the sands. I, John Colrec and she spoke with such a terrible intensity that the drunken mockery on the man's face changed to one of swinish stupidity. The sea roars for the victim it will not keep. There is snow upon the hills, John Korek, and ere it melts your corpse will lie at my feet. And I shall spit upon it, and be content. Korek and his crony sailed at dawn for a long voyage, and Maul went back to her hut and her clam gathering. She seemed to grow leaner and more grim than ever, and her eyes smoldered with a light knot saying. The days glided by and people whispered among themselves that Maul's days were numbered, for she faded to a ghost of a woman, but she went her way, refusing all aid. That was a short, cold summer and the snow on the barren inland hills never melted, a thing very unusual, which caused much comment among the villagers. At dusk and at dawn Maul would come up on the beach, gaze up at the snow which glittered on the hills, then out to sea with a fierce intensity in her gaze. Then the days grew shorter, the nights longer and darker, and the cold gray tides came sweeping along the bleak strands, bearing the rain and sleet of the sharp east breezes. And upon a bleak day a trading vessel sailed into the bay and anchored. And all the idlers and the wastrels flocked to the wharfs, for that was the ship upon which John Colrec and Lilip Canole had sailed. Down the gangplank came Lilip, more furtive than ever, but John Colrec was not there. To shouted queries, Canole shook his head. Colrec deserted ship at a port of Sumatra, said he. He had a row with the skipper, lads, wanted me to desert, too, but no. I had to see you fine lads again, eh, boys? Almost cringing was Lilip Canole and suddenly he recoiled as Maul Farrell came through the throng. A moment they stood eyeing each other, then Maul's grim lips bent in a terrible smile. There's blood on your hand, Kunal. She lashed out suddenly, so suddenly that Lilip started and rubbed his right hand across his left sleeve. Stand aside, witch. He snarled in sudden anger, striding through the crowd which gave back for him. His admirers followed him to the tavern. Now, I mind that the next day was even colder. Great fogs came drifting out of the east and veiled the sea and the beaches. There would be no sailing that day, and so all the villagers were in their snug houses or matching tails at the tavern. So it came about that Joe, my friend, a lad of my own age, and I, were the ones who saw the first of the strange thing that happened. Being harem scarum lads of no wisdom, we were sitting in a small rowboat, floating at the end of the wharfs, each shivering and wishing the other would suggest leaving, there being no reason whatever for our being there, save that it was a good place to build air castles undisturbed. Suddenly Joe raised his hand. Say, he said, d'ye hear? Who can be out on the bay upon a day like this? Nobody. What d'ye hear? Oars. Or I'm a lover. Listen. There was no seeing anything in that fog, and I heard nothing. Yet Joe swore he did, and suddenly his face assumed a strange look. Somebody rowing out there, I tell you. The bay is alive with oars from the sound. A score of boats at the least. Ye dolt, can ye not hear? Then, as I shook my head, he leaped and began to undo the painter. I'm off to sea. Name me liar if the bay is not full of boats, all together like a close fleet. Are you with me? Yes, I was with him, though I heard nothing. Then out in the grayness we went, and the fog closed behind and before so that we drifted in a vague world of smoke, seeing not and hearing not. We were lost in no time, 
and I cursed Joe for leading us upon a wild goose chase that was like to end with our being swept out to sea. I thought of Maul Farrell's girl and shuddered. How long we drifted I know not. Minutes faded into hours, hours into centuries. Still Joe swore he heard the oars, now close at hand, now far away, and for hours we followed them, steering our course toward the sound, as the noise grew or receded. This I later thought of, and could not understand. Then, when my hands were so numb that I could no longer hold the oar, and the forerunning drowsiness of cold and exhaustion was stealing over me, bleak white stars broke through the fog which glided suddenly away, fading like a ghost of smoke, and we found ourselves afloat just outside the mouth of the bay. The waters lay smooth as a pond, all dark green and silver in the starlight, and the cold came crisper than ever. I was swinging the boat about, to put back into the bay, when Joe gave a shout, and for the first time I heard the clack of oarlocks. I glanced over my shoulder, and my blood went cold. A great beaked prow loomed above us, a weird, unfamiliar shape against the stars, and as I caught my breath, sheared sharply and swept by us, with a curious swishing I never heard any other craft make. Joe screamed and backed oars frantically and the boat walled out of the way just in time, for though the prow had missed us, still otherwise we had died. For from the sides of the ship stood long oars, bank upon bank which swept her along. Though I had never seen such a craft, I knew her for a galley. But what was she doing upon our coasts? They said the farfarers that such ships were still in use among the heathens of Barbary, but it was many a long, heaving mile to Barbary and even so she did not resemble the ships described by those who had sailed far. We started in pursuit, and this was strange, for though the waters broke about her prow, and she seemed fairly to fly through the waves, yet she was making little speed, and it was no time before we caught up with her. Making our painter fast to a chain far back beyond the reach of the swishing oars, we hailed those on deck. But there came no answer, and at last, conquering our fears, we clambered up the chain and found ourselves upon the strangest deck man has trod for many a long, roaring century. This is no Barbary rover, muttered Joe fearsomely. Look how old it seems. Almost ready to fall to pieces. Why, tis fairly rotten. There was no one on deck, no one at the long sweep with which the craft was steered. We stole to the hold and looked down the stair. Then and there, if ever men were on the verge of insanity, it was we. For there were rowers there, it is true, they sat upon the rowers' benches and drove the creaking oars through the grey waters. And they that rowed were skeletons. Shrieking, we plunged across the deck, to fling ourselves into the sea. But at the rail I tripped upon something and fell headlong, and as I lay, I saw a thing which vanquished my fear of the horrors below for an instant. The thing upon which I had tripped was a human body, and in the dim gray light that was beginning to steal across the eastern waves I saw a dagger hilt standing up between his shoulders. Joe was at the rail, urging me to haste, and together we slid down the chain and cut the painter. Then we stood off into the bay. Straight on kept the grim galley, and we followed, slowly, wondering. She seemed to be heading straight for the beach beside the wharfs and as we approached, we saw the wharfs thronged with people. They had missed us, no doubt, and now they stood, there in the early dawn light, struck down by the apparition which had come up out of the night and the grim ocean. Straight on swept the galley, her oars a swish, then ere she reached the shallow water, crash dot, a terrific reverberation shook the bay. Before our eyes the grim craft seemed to melt away, then she vanished and the green water seethed where she had ridden, but there floated no driftwood there, nor did there ever float any ashore. Aye, something floated ashore, but it was grim driftwood. We made the landing amid a hum of excited conversation that stopped suddenly. Maul Farrell stood before her hut, limbed gauntly against the ghostly dawn, her lean hand pointing seaward. And across the sighing wet sands borne by the great tide, something came floating something that the waves dropped at Maul Farrell's feet. And there looked up at us, as we crowded about, a pair of unseeing eyes set in a still, 
white face. John Korek had come home. Still and grim he lay, rocked by the tide, and as he lurched sideways, all saw the dagger hilt that stood from his back, the dagger all of us had seen a thousand times at the belt of Lilith Canoe. Ah, I killed him, came Canoe's shriek, as he writhed and groveled before our gaze. At sea on a still night in a drunken brawl I slew him and hurled him overboard. And from the far seas he has followed me, his voice sank to a hideous whisper, because of the curse the sea would not keep his body. And the wretch sank down, trembling, the shadow of the gallows already in his eyes. I, strong, deep and exultant was Maul Farrell's voice. From the hell of lost craft Satan sent a ship of bygone ages. A ship red with gore and stained with the memory of horrid crimes. None other would bear such a vile carcass. The sea has taken vengeance and has given me mine. See now how I spit upon the face of John Colrec. And with a ghastly laugh, she pitched forward, the blood starting to her lips. And the sun came up across the restless sea. End of Sea Curse by Robert E. Howard